Okay, let's start the show. For Thursday, August 8th, 2019, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the podcast this week. We said the upgrades were coming, and boy, do we got some upgrades. Well, our biggest upgrade is Kishore's back this week. Yeah, take that, Zach. I'm an upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> Top of the Rolodex. Kishore, how was your week off? Uh, it was great. I worked. Oh, we had mostly we had visitors from out of town. Oh, do anything fun? I can't remember because I'm in my 40s. Yeah. Yeah. It's going around. You know, the, the thing I do is I put everything I plan on doing, even the most minute detail, into uh, Google Calendar. Because everything is Google Calendar now. So if I like need to know... Like, how minute? Like, well, like... Norm, you should pee. Like no, 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 no. Like, went to the mall. Or, you know, brunch with friends. That kind of thing. Like if, I, if the plan is made via text message, it's going in the Google Calendar. Yeah. So I know, and it's shared between our family, so... I know one. It's on the calendar when it's upcoming, and then when the once it's been happened, uh, that can go back and say, "Oh, that's why I did that past week." Once it's been happened. Once it's happened. That's right. That's right. It's early. Jeremy, how much would you pay for this coffee? Uh, that's what. <laughs> it looks like medicine. It looks like iodine. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it does look like Robitussin. So uh, let's describe this uh, paint a word picture. It is. Probably it looks like Robitussin. Six inches tall. It has six fluid ounces. Okay. Of coffee. It's a small bottle that's not a traditional bottle shape. It does look a little bit more like a medicine bottle. Yeah. With a relative to the di- maybe like a two inch diameter on the bottom, but the top one inch diameter. So like it's not like your traditional, you know, Starbucks Frappuccino bottle. It's interesting that they tell you exactly the amount of caffeine on the label. It's oh, which is two hundred and twenty five milligrams. That's a lot of caffeine. Really? For that much liquid? Yeah. So it's very dark. Also has some like Chinese Japanese text, I think. Is it Japanese cold brew? Invented by Dutch sailors. Oh, okay. And it's called? <laughs> it's called Drip Dash. I don't know. It's $5 Whoa. for this little shot of juice. I mean, it's not something I'm typically going to buy, but I was curious. And I needed something without sugar. And so I grabbed this. Little did I know you were going to make coffee. I didn't make coffee. I, we What's used to have cold brew in oh, the office. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe I'll alter my plans in the future. Yeah. Well, so that was your experiment. $5. And you don't like it. It's fine. This it's thing is fine. ridiculous. Uh, so it was, it was invented by Dutch sailors, but it was perfected by Japanese artisans. Uh. <laughs> and it's handcrafted in small batches, one drop at a time, over 16 hours. Really? That's the smallest of batches. God, I don't know. Is they that... just like put a low flow valve on this and yeah. was like, let's call it expensive. How do you know if that's true or not? <laughs> we'll artificially limit how much we can produce yep. in order to charge more for it. Well, in order to say we did that, and then uh, I'm pretty sure there's no shortage of this coffee at my grocery store. Mm. Mm. Well, thanks for the coffee review. How was your past week, Jeremy? I went to Pinburg. That's well, right. More at, yeah, the bigger picture is I went to Replay Effects, which is an event in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I talked about it last week. Little did I know, some people in the area did not know about it. Oh, and, and, so, and listened to the podcast and yes, went? That's great. And went and had Public a, service. a great time. Uh, a handful of fans came up and said hi uh, so I, that I got to meet, which is always one of the best parts about going to these events. But I also got to play in the, in the tournament. This is the world's largest pinball tournament in history. Let's get the play-by-play. A thousand players came in from all over the world to play in Pinburg. I, again, qualified for my... <laughs> With my brethren in the D division, um, which I'm perfectly happy with. That's fourth level? There's good people in that division. There's like solidly like good players, but also just decent people. The D division are decent people. <laughs> unlike unlike uh, A, B, and C. Well, um, if you get into A, you're likely signing up for some serious pressure and tension right. and maybe anger issues. You're saying the complexity <laughs> gets, uh, the, the competition, level yeah. of competition gets exactly. to people. But I walked away with $225. Hey. Uh, back in my pocket, which was uh, uh, you know a lot of fun. Um, what, I, what place is that? 
It does, I don't I even know. I didn't oh. I didn't make it to the playoffs. Oh. I I got to the third day, which means you make some money. And then I got to the second round of playoffs, but or um like the whatever. I guess they are called the playoffs, but I didn't make the finals this year. You are in in the money. Yeah, exactly. And even in D division in the money, but not significant enough to D, D division starts at $200. I increase that. That's great. To 225. And that's that's actually a, a that's a big, pretty big prize pool. What's the top prize pool? $15,000. Wow. Yeah. Second place, I think it's half that. Uh, it's it's the best event. It is the absolute pinnacle of pinball tournaments. Everyone in the world who plays pinball wants to go to this event. Mm. So the event sells out. Thousand slots this year sold out in seconds, and every year they've been trying to increase it. I'll be curious to see if they can do that again because a thousand players seems like a lot. Our past competitors grandfathered in to guarantee no, a place. No, not you, not even the winner. Oh wow! No, everyone's got to got to click know, click, click as fast as possible. After the clicks, you, there's a, a, waiting, oh, a wait list. And you would think that they would want to bring back past winners to defend their titles. Um, you know, then yeah, where do you draw the line? Right. I don't know. Right. But the top 10. The top players never seem to have a problem getting in. There, <laughs> oh. there are, there are like, it's questionable how like, locked down the whole sign-up process is. Yeah. Because you can sign up other people when you sign up. So there ends up being a lot of the similar names on the list right after the signups. And then they only keep one. The others drop off. People from the wait list get in. And the system works one All way right. or another. Much less interested in the <coughs> signup process, more interested in the actual <laughs> competition itself. You've described pinball competitions before. The way it works, uh, as I understand it, you are assigned machines that you may have played before, may have a lot of experience or not a lot of experience before, and then in your group, you try to get the highest score for those machines or just, those series of machines. Just so. FYI, for those watching the YouTube video on our screen behind us, uh, we're showing a walkthrough of Pinberg right now. This is actually a walkthrough of Replay FX. Of Replay so, FX. <coughs> Pinberg is a small quadrant of Replay FX, which is a larger, like California Extreme style event. With but much our, bigger. So arcades like. and, uh, you know, there aren't bouncy houses this year, but there was a Ferris wheel. <laughs> Whoa. Huge retro consoles area. 250 CRT TVs connected to retro consoles. It's an amazing event. Um, but yes, um, as far as the pinball competition goes, uh, you play 10 rounds of four games each over the course of two days. 40 games over two days. Yeah. Uh, with games, so each of those are games of four players. Four players, three balls each. Yeah. That and, kind of thing. and the games are set up super tight, you know, so if you, you don't want to shake them, they'll tilt. Uh, the rubbers are removed out of the outlines, so the ball will likely drain if you go anywhere near them. Oh, so the, the, you type mean like they are difficult. Yes. They, they... Yeah, and so because the best of the best are there, and they don't want the games to go forever. Got it. Uh, last year, in fact, like one of the Bay Area favorites actually went forever, and the, the officials came over and said, stop. You've already made it to the next you, round. Yeah, no, you don't... You, no matter what happens, you'll get a win here. And then he got off. They said, anybody surpasses his score, you also win. <laughs> and they did. Oh, <laughs> so it was that machine, maybe. It went forever. It, it, okay. it, yeah, that game was not set up hard enough. Got it. World, uh, I didn't know you could tune games to be harder or, or easier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's an amazing event. It's a marathon of, of pinball. Yeah. It just is over 12 hours a day, it seems like, of pinball. And uh, then in the, if you do well enough, you get to play a third day. Can you tell us the games you went through, or at least some of the notable games you I went could, through? I could look it up, but I have no idea. Any, anything stand out in your memory? You as play like, so many games you never play. Uh, that I mean, you've never played before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like, I don't know. There's a game called Torpedo Alley or something, which is crazy. All, there's so many games there you've never played. Is What's it the, all modern games, yeah. at least? No, dude. It's like, in fact, every bank, so every single round, you're playing games from all eras, because every bank is set up to have an old electromechanical game. Uh, which which has no computer in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you have the er, like the early solid states from the eighties, and then you have like one or two, or you always have like another solid state and a modern game or two modern games. So styles of play may have to change even yeah. within each set because you're going from slow to fast, and yeah. you, you have multi ball. Sometimes tilt ends game with the early games, so you got to be very careful. Is there a Ken Jennings strategy or that most recent guy who did really well at Jeopardy, like the high risk strategy of like? Just going for the high points on the games, the modern games that like you know really well. Is there is there some type of tactics that I way? I don't know. That's a good question. Right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm I'm clearly a, a D division player, so I, I don't have the answer to that. I guess my next question is: Is there a documentary people can watch about competitive pinball? There's lots of documentaries about pinball. I don't know if there's one. There's a good one called um, Special When Lit. 
I would recommend. Uh, that is um, good name. Yeah, it it is a it is a sort of a, it's about a person who plays pinball, but it's also it's largely about his competitive uh, play. And then which documents that person's journey yeah. through a tournament or mm-hmm. multiple tournaments. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. The I special guess, one yeah. led. All yeah. right. I'll have to check that out. Um, it's it's everyone should go. It's an amazing event. I love replay effects so much. I lo- it's like pinball summer camp. Every year I look forward to it. My twelve year old came with me this year. They have a LAN there with like forty machines. That's right, you mentioned yeah, yeah. And everybody on this LAN, like most people at replay effects, they're kind of our generation and they brought their kids. But they're, you know, at least in their late twenties, thirties, forties. Everyone on the LAN is about sixteen. Like everybody there, it's amazing because you look over the. Is that heads surprising because everybody there. for PC gaming, like it's younger players. It's I mean, as like a PC gamer myself, like yeah. my roots of that, I kind of expected to see more people from our generation, but it's just it's not. It's uh, it's the young kids. What are they playing though? They're practicing Fortnite, they're of course, because that's Fortnite. like every Uber driver I went with who I told I was at Replay Facts, that was the topic. Like, well, hey, what about that kid that won three million dollars last week? Wow, I saw it on Fallon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's so that's in the that's in the year. All right. Perfect time then to talk about our top story this week. Top story this week. So uh, I was debating about whether to make this top story, but I think it's worthy of the top story. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those stories that, again, I wish we had the report from your 12-year-old son, because he might have a lot to say about this. But the biggest story in maybe entertainment and technology this past week is, well, the Ninja news. The Ninja news, the news that streamer Ninja mm-hmm. has switched sides and was picked up, uh, signed a contract with Microsoft's Mixer streaming service and has left Twitch. Well, it's n- huge. Now that everybody has heard of Mixer, I should say I. Um, You've I'm, been I'm, on Mixer forever. I, I, I don't have objectivity here. Like I, I have a dog in this race. I have been working on a project at Mixer for months now with Other Ocean with yes. Mike, Mike Micah's yeah. game studio. Yeah, I mean to, to be clear, you're uh, with Other Ocean, Mike Micah, who's been a guest on this podcast and who worked with you guys on the Star Lords project. This is something you guys have announced: Tankball Project Tankball. Yeah, it's a it's a remote controlled. Uh, like soccer between with real robots that you control remotely, and it is exclusive to the Mixer service. Exactly. So yeah, you can go on there, you can drive a robots around and play soccer, and it's a yeah. blast. Um, but so I, it's been funny to me because nobody really knows about Mixer, and now everybody knows about Mixer. Top store on the uh, App Store. It's and, the top app in the App Store. And so Mixer uh, uh, Ninja moved over there. He announced he was going to do it, and then like a couple days later, he did his first stream at uh, Lollapalooza, mm-hmm. and he ended up with a, a million views. Yeah, he had uh, like so the story that that's sort of been happening is Ninja's stream count on Twitch has been going down pretty steadily. He's not the top streamer. He wasn't the top streamer on Twitch when he left. Just by the numbers, just by like the sheer number of concurrent views and and, and stuff. So he had been declining for a while, and it people associate that with some declines in view related to Fortnite. But I think the the World Cup has let's say, re-energized a Fortnite viewing crowd. But Mm -hmm. when he uh, came over to Mixer, Microsoft offered free one-month sub. I think it might be free two-month sub now uh, to Ninja. And, like, his stream numbers were up, like, 40K uh, during that Lollapalooza stream. And and I was watching. It was it was fun. I, I mean, mean, the big question was it's, it was about talent versus platform, right? Were people going to follow him over and download a new app and watch a new service? Essentially, and you know, in, in the old terms, it's actually quite different than just switching like TV channels. Well, on the PC, it is. It's, PC is the same thing. PC is right? the same it's thing. Just, yeah. But some people, if you talk about video games, yeah, right, people are sometimes very tied to their platforms. When we're talking about Steam versus the Epic Game Store, for example, because uh, that's where their money. Is tied into, and, and to some extent, that's where people who are subscribed to Twitch, either via the Amazon Prime subscription or who actually pay per month, are monetarily tied to 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 the uh, platform. I think that's an, a non-trivial thing. The fact that like a lot of people have Amazon Prime, so they have free subs. When you go over to Mixer, like yeah, you'll get this free one month sub to, to Ninja, but you don't have free subs for anyone on the site. So I'm curious how that's going to play out. I'm also curious how. The features of Mixer that are different from Twitch are actually going to be used by by top streamers. So you can actually have the crowd control the action. You do this on the tank ball game. The appeal of Mixer for developers is they have a, an API that allows you to tap into input. 
from your viewers. So either on mobile or on Xbox or on PC, um, you can actually get all kinds of, you know, basically like real time controls over what's happening on screen. And th they have low enough latency that you can get down to sub second input, you know, response rates. So that's the other benefit too. Uh, so Microsoft's put a lot of energy behind the latency and that's something that allows something like that Project Tankball to happen. But how does someone like a streamer take advantage of low latency in terms of user interaction? Yeah. I, I've, there's a pinball streamer named Deadflip who's on Twitch and he hooked up a pinball machine to chat so the chat could control the flippers by typing left and right. Like that's... Wow. <laughs> and it... The, uh, his latency wasn't great. I think they could easily get it better even on Twitch, but that's no way to control a pinball machine. But it would be interesting to see something like that happen uh, on Mixer, where you could get lower latency, but I'm not sure how it incorporates, how it gets implemented into Fortnite. Yeah, I, I think the real test will be after that free month and a half trial, you know, after September 30th. Having a million subscribers there, does that convert to $6 a month for, for users? Because yeah. the, the rumored... Uh, contract of this deal, which is completely unverified, is fifty million, which is a crazy Holy amount cow. of money. That is rumored, completely rumored. Uh, that, but that's what I think. I believe uh, uh, Tom Warren of the, the Verge had tweeted for what length of time? Do you know? I don't know. This is yeah. I think the real question is isn't like what what happens to Ninja? Like I mean, that's an open question. But are other streamers going to go over too? I know Mixer already has like a streamer base, but. A lot of the most followed, most watched accounts, they're all on Twitch still. Yeah. So is anyone else going to go? Yeah, and how does Microsoft, in you know, not only in the short term, while they have a lot of people interested in downloading the app right now, how do they leverage that into expanding what people know, you know about their services? Because uh, it's, you know, they're tied to Xbox. So they have Xbox integration uh, with Mixer. You know, how do they really capitalize on this? And so in six months' time, it's not just I don't know, they I, have Ninja. I you could make the argument that they've already capitalized on it. They have a million people watching something on Mixer now. You know, event, like the reason why Gary went on Twitch to do his commentary track wasn't because he liked Twitch. It was because everyone else is on Twitch. Like that's just where the audience is. So if Microsoft can get an audience on Mixer, then it makes it a more viable platform to choose to do things on. And for them, it really is about how to get creators on the platform. And yeah, exactly. creators not just necessarily paying them directly, which may be a strategy, right? It may be their plan is to go out to top X number of streamers and, and sign co exclusivity contracts, which would then make it very much like an entertainment industry association. We're talking about, you know, this is almost going back to the, the studio days of signing you know, contract players for, for studios. You want this talent, you want to see their movies, you got to watch it through this studio. Uh, or is it about attracting uh, creators via better ad rev deals or more friendlier, you know, the, the, just rev share or technology, like what is their next step plan, which I'm sure they've all thought about. Uh, but, and, and how do you capitalize on Mindshare, right? Like, will we still be talking about Mixer a month from now? Can you still, can you do almost everything you can do on Twitch on YouTube? No, YouTube is kind of... YouTube gaming has yeah, sort of lost, lost it, yeah. internal support. Um, but yes, you can in terms of functionality. And I, I think Facebook has a streaming service yeah. too, where, I mean, a, Twitch isn't that complicated in terms of what you can do. It's like you can donate to the subscriber. There's a chat. It seems like there's a big mod. There's some, like a, a lot of mods. Yeah, that, like visual mods for when you get bits and things. Yeah, but those are developed independently. Like right. Twitch just allows interfaces for that to happen, but other platforms have that too. And also, all of these platforms, whether it's YouTube, Mixer, or Twitch, have to have the back end to vet content from a legal perspective. You know, uh, Twitch gets away with a lot of the stuff by not really uh, promoting the the uh, video on demand stuff. You can archive clips, but they kind of they don't stay there forever. But you know, YouTube has content ID, so I don't know what Mixer has in terms of, you know, because when people do live streams, they're not vetted, right? Like people so can. Twitch has actually gotten better at this because even I was watching the the Democratic debates what, like last week, and that those were airing on CNN, which is a pay service here in the states. So uh, CNN, like somehow, the, like Twitch was pulling down streams where they're showing the Democratic debate and quickly too. So they have some sort of algorithm in the background that must be matching. I don't know how they, how it, it's going to be on Mixer or some of the other platforms.
but I'm sure they have that built in. Um, does your kid watch Ninja? My kid has watched Ninja, and I I didn't even know how like much he watched Ninja until I watched Ninja myself, and I realized some of the things that my kid says he got from Ninja. Uh, like the way he says, I God, I can't even remember right thanks now. Thanks for the dono, man. <laughs> Not, like that kind of stuff. Um, oh yes, he goes what? <laughs> it's it's like it's something that it's something that that a Ninja does, and my son has completely adopted it. I think that's a ongoing phenomenon, you know, whether it's from PewDiePie, you know, any, any type of internet celebrity. And You're not giving Ninja credit for this? No, no, no. I, I'm, I think this is why they're successful. They create personalities right. and, they're, and the, the, the culture around them, the community that's built around them have shared language. You know, even if you guys watch Will and his streams, there are catchphrases and things that you guys can acknowledge to each other. And I'm sure that is something that plays out on the, uh, the playground. Yeah, praise the Will. Uh, the one thing that was really interesting about Ninja Stream, I, I watched for a little bit, is he was playing with other players that were streaming on Twitch, like other famous players. So it was this weird cross-platform yeah. situation happening, and it was all seamless. I mean, it didn't make a difference to the game, right? Right. And you could switch between the two channels and watch the different perspectives, I guess. Yeah. I mean, you can't do like um, uh, some people uh, do multi-view streams where yeah. you can see multiple players, but yeah. you, so you can't do that cross-platform, but... Who cares? And I guess the biggest place where this would be impactful is if you're not on desktop, if you're on mobile or set top, and you can only run the one app at the time. Unless there's a third party app that can do some type of split screen. But I don't think that would be allowed. Why is this such a big deal? I think it's a big deal because potentially there's a lot of money involved. And this talks to the culture of watching content. Money for Ninja? Money for Ninja and money for Microsoft. <laughs> I, but did, really? Because I, is Twitch even profitable? It doesn't. I, I don't know. Probably don't know, but it doesn't seem like they're there yet. And so, it's certainly, Mixer's not profitable yet. But if, regardless if, of whether they're profitable, they have. There's the momentum they have is important. Like what they, yeah. the service they provide, if it was to go away, like it, it is how a very significant portion of the people who watch internet live internet video, yeah, yeah. you know, get their content. It's it, a, it, the numbers are staggering too. Like I think three or four million people watch the. Uh, Fortnite World Cup. That's more than a lot of sporting events that are live. And it directly the, competes with your ESPNs and your other live TV. We should be talking about it in the context of like ESPN and sports watching. That's where, where we're at. And like if you watch uh, Patriot Got this week, which is a, a great um, show on Netflix, did an analysis of just the economics between like video game streaming and. Oh, I should watch what, that. Yeah, I mean, it was mostly about unionizing in video mm. games. It's actually very good. But has, has ESPN done any partnerships with Twitch? And they have a e they show esports game stuff now. Twitch, e not ESPN. not Twitch, but they show esports events. It really was technology catching up with the culture because if we think back to 10, 15 years ago, esports. We remember when we were a PC gamer, there were like waves of esports stories. The Unreal putting out a million dollars, and the money kind of was there, but the ability to reach people and the way people were. In engaging with their idols, with the, you know, that's why it happened maybe in Korea first, because they had the broadband and they had technology to stream it out. Um, and so when people were, Starcraft, Starcraft 2 was coming out and people were paying subscriptions to watch tournaments, that's all transferred to people paying subscriptions to watch Twitch competitors. I was watching Critical Role this week. F almost 50,000 people were watching a three hour. D and D game live. Yeah. That's more than than some over the air channels, depending on what's on. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's move on then to then the pop culture. Pop culture, new culture. So Disney had their big annual, uh, or maybe it was a quarterly sh shareholders call uh, this past week, and they announced a lot. They talked about a lot for sure. Uh, not necessarily just about the MCU stuff, and this is before their big D23 convention, but they talked specifically about uh, the Disney Plus service, which is uh, launching in November, and we all knew ahead of time that they had previously talked about uh, the $8 a month subscription and so like uh, $80 a year, $70 a year, whatever it was. They were undercutting yep. that Netflix price uh, with 
you know, uh, Pixar movies, some MCU movies, uh, which will grow number as their deal with Netflix expires, as well as some stuff from the Disney vault and original shows, of course. Uh, but we were all wondering how would this tie into the other properties that Disney owns, namely Hulu, which they have controlling shares in and is a technically competing streaming service. Well, they announced that there's going to be a bundle, a bundle room, and it will be $13 that will get you Disney Plus. It will get you Hulu, the ad-supported version of Hulu, but people typically still have to pay for it to get on set-top boxes, and ESPN Plus. And did they say resolution, number of um, simultaneous viewers? I don't believe they talked about that. Okay. But presumably, it's the same as what you would normally get for, for Hulu. I, I, and pretty standard. I don't know in some teams. I, uh, I think it's two. Uh, they might as well have named this like the Kishore bundle. Because I, like, I'm, I must be a weird Ven here. Because I, I want Disney+. Plus. <laughs> I have ESPN+. Plus and I have Hulu. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, so, and my wife watches a lot of Hulu. She, like, she loves Handmaid's Tale. Um, I watch stuff on ESPN Plus, and I read. And ESPN Plus includes some um, like paywalled articles as well. Do you so, know what you pay for Hulu and ESPN Plus? Um, combined? ESPN Plus is five. Hulu is part of a Spotify bundle I have right now. Um, but it like I'm looking at it as Disney Plus is whatever eight. Uh, ESPN Plus is five, and now I'm getting Hulu for free. But this is not Hulu of, Live TV. No, no. Hulu Plus Live TV, Hulu Live TV is its own garbage. thing, which is still $45 a month. But this does start, because ESPN would be live, presumably live ESPN games. You get um, a live ESPN shows. You don't get live like ESPN content, uh, but you get like replays of stuff. So, so like, you don't get live and, Sports Center or, or live games. That's still no. So this is still not moving into the YouTube TV, into the Hulu Plus Live TV no. realm. This is still kind of the VOD world. Yeah, I mean, you get games that are not broadcast on ESPN. So a lot of soccer matches. Uh, you get replays of, like, every NHL game over the season, but after they happen. Interesting. I, I really like ESPN+. Plus. Like, Katie Nolan shows on there, which is really fun. Uh, but to me, this is basically, like, you pick one of these three, and you're getting them for, essentially, free versus what the other two cost. And will you access all three of these through the Hulu app? I presume it will be through a Disney Plus app. Which oh, yeah? Is something they're going to show more Are you sure about that? Of you think D20. they're going to integrate the three apps? Oh, no, I, I think you're right. I think you're, it would be ESPN. You would be one, one login. I mean, that's a lot of back-end work to do, especially since we don't know if the, if the departments making the apps are the same departments. I think it's going to be three different apps. With one login? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. I think I might just be going D Plus, guys. I don't need... I have a Hulu subscription, but I don't watch it. Yeah. I'm thinking about canceling that, and I, I don't... Watch the ESPN. I think that the, as we talked about, like the number of streaming services, you know, what is your upper limit of streaming services, even outside the live TV stuff, right? Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu, Disney, whatever, Criterion, other, other uh, lesser known ones. Like, how many of those can you sustain? Uh, Disney Plus is much more attractive when, in my mind, it's $8 a month or $70 a year than it is when it starts moving into the $13 to $15 yeah. range. And I'm not canceling Netflix. Sorry, Disney. I mean, eventually they feel like they, they. I think they believe they can get people to switch. I guess we'll see. Because my big argument for Netflix is we watched it as a family, mm -hmm. and obviously that's what Disney's entire content bundle is about. So we'll see. And they they're not. A lot of people like Zach talks about how he subscribes to CBS All Access for specific shows and then cancels. And a lot of people are willing to do that. Uh, Disney Plus doesn't want to be like that service. Yeah. They want to have something new. And well, a big back catalog. Kevin Feige's whole uh, like SDCC announcement was about having a cadence of shows so that it won't let you cancel. Yeah. <laughs> it won't let you. So uh, other news that kind of came out of this earnings call was the acquisition of Fox kind of shook things up a little bit. Uh, we knew that they had canceled a bunch of Fox projects. They're still, of course, pushing Avatar, Avatar Two, I mean, three, four, five, mm -hmm. uh, two to be to come. Uh, but they took a big loss with the release of Dark Phoenix, and their explanation is that because of the complexities uh, around the merger, momentum was lost because of confusion. I have a different explanation. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I think the Rotten Tomato score would, would be yeah, indicative that's of the that, explanation. That, that which explanation, that which is sucked. what <laughs> that people didn't like the movie. No, I know, but what was the Rotten Tomato score? Do you know? It was, it was like thirteen or something. Oh like, my! Like, it, it was real low. Rotten. 
All right. Yeah, you know how they, when they, Rotten Tomatoes announces, like they make a whole big deal of revealing the tomato score. Uh-huh. They like they hold the reviews, which I, I'm not a fan of this this policy. Right? They they make like an unveiling, you know, and then they have an animation that r- the numbers start, the the percentage scores goes up, and then it's, and then it's certified fresh. Yeah, Dark Phoenix, 23 percent on Rotten Tomatoes, <laughs> so it did not did, did not get a grand unveiling. Got it for that. Uh, but they're gonna still push forward with a bunch of uh, so Fox. Properties. They're, they're saying that it's going to be a select group of high quality movies. Some of the movies that may have already been made may be released on Hulu or Disney Plus. Uh, but they're doing reboots. Here's the big news: reboots considering for Disney Plus, Home Alone, uh. and Night at the Museum, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, I think as well. Uh, but Home Alone is the big. Okay, at least Home Alone came out like 25 years ago or something, right? Yep. Night at the Museum came, didn't that come out like in the 2000s? How old is that? Movie? I never saw that. That was was that Robin Williams? Uh, he was in the he uh, was. first yeah. two, I think. But it's a Ben Stiller movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then Diary of a Wimpy Kid. I watched like the sequel with my kid this summer. Mm-hmm. What is that about? Maybe maybe not less a, a reboot in the way we're thinking about reboots, but maybe the, the next phase of it, the continuation of it, will live on in Disney Plus as opposed mm-hmm. to my wife releases. and son love that book series. Mm-hmm. I mean, my it, kid devoured that series. It makes yeah. a lot of sense to me. Uh, and then in terms of the theme park stuff, of course, we're all excited for Rise of the Resistance, that new ride to open uh, early next year, or before the end of this year, some around then, uh, on, on both parks. First, I think, in Walt Disney World and then Disneyland. Uh, but attendance was down, and they credit the fear of the, the, uh, the, the uh, Galaxy's Edge crowding impacted summer attendance, that people were... Of course, increased ticket prices, and that could have been it as well. Wait, are you saying overall Disneyland attendance was down? Overall, d- Disneyland and Disney World attendance was down three percent. What? Like in the during the opening of a new Star Wars? Yes. S- like park? That's no, I was surprised. And their logic is that pe- one people were the people that were going to go anyway were waiting. A lot of people were waiting to go after the park of uh, the uh, Galaxy's Edge opened, and then when Galaxy's Edge opened. A lot of people stayed away because they felt like it would be too crowded. That was their logic. But good news for Disney. What? Guess what? what? Retail, food, yep. and other things, up 10%. <laughs> they still made money. They, okay. Did they, so attendance was down, but due to the ticket price increase, did they actually make the more money? Ticket price increase and people you know, spending $200 on lightsabers oh, or yeah. 100 bucks on lightsabers, whatever it was, to, to build your lightsaber and, and, and buy more food there. I guess I'm not going back to Disney anytime soon, but... They have really, they have really streamlined the process of being at a park, of spending money. Oh yeah, <laughs> just like you order food through apps, and it's just ready when you show up it's at all the restaurant. Risk man like, based, and yeah, just everything is with your little magic pass, and like that is a money vacuum. Yeah, November twelfth is a launch day for Disney Plus. Uh, I can't wait for D twenty three, which is at the end of this month, to see what that looks like and see what their content and see exact release timing. We- we, we don't actually have a launch content um, item up there because none of the Marvel pieces come till later right. but the, in Mandal- the cycle. Is the Mandalorian a launch? S- oh, I series? don't know. I think, I mean, it should be. I thought oh, it was. Yeah. Maybe. It's got to be. I, well, the, I'm Does not sure, so sure about that because you nine? got, you got yeah. nine uh, in December. Yep. And so I don't think they want to you know, kill anticipation for nine hmm. by confusing the hmm. you know, with the Mandalorian release. The Mandalorian feels like the thing come out right after Nine. Okay. That is my gut feeling. Uh, speaking of things that are not in the MCU, though, although related to Marvel, so last week uh, we talked about potential directors for Venom 2. Well, Hollywood Reporter has, uh, report, or Friday actually reported that Andy Serkis has nabbed that gig to direct Venom 2. Actor, director, Andy Serkis? Actor, director. No, no I mean, Sir- like, is he going to be an oh, actor in this, too? I, you know, I don't think he needs to be. I, I, I actually hope he isn't. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that you know let let him flex as a as a director. Uh, I didn't see his Jungle Book, his version of the Jungle Book film uh, that he did with Warner Brothers released on Netflix. But um, I know he did some um, second unit stuff with uh, the Hobbit. So you know, I I, I I trust him. You're talking about Mowgli, Legend of the Jungle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think Christian Bale's in that. Yeah. Do you know any circus when he did Gollum? He was 36 years old. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Late bloomer. Late bloomer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's hope it's for all of late. us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, getting there. Uh, big news for those of us who grew up in the 90s. The Matrix is approaching its 20th, an- 20th anniversary this year. Well, it's that? already past the 20th anniversary, but yes. But they're going to, f- to celebrate that. Yep. And all three of those films, I believe, are now released on 4K Blu-ray with HDR. I have that huh. first one, and it is a fantastic 4K Blu-ray. They did some color correction that fixed a lot of what they did for the initial blue, uh, DVD releases that made it too green. Really? Yeah. So it's, it's, they brought in, I believe, the colorists of the, and the DP uh, of, of The Matrix to help, cool. to help certify that and verify it for that release. But if you want to see it on the big screen, you will have your chance at the end of this month uh, select theaters are going to be putting up The Matrix in Dolby Dolby Cinema, I believe, the, uh, August, the week of August 30th. But it is the theatrical cut, as far as we know, right? Like, there's nothing new about it. Nothing new. No. There, there, but there, you say that as if there was a director's cut. There is no director's cut. No, either. I know. Yeah, it, it's just, I mean, it's, it's the exact movie you right. could buy on there's Blu-ray. Not, but, there's but, not, but there's not even an outtake at the end of the credits, right? This I, is, do you need that? No. Excuse me, but Marvel thought we needed it. Well, Marvel, no, no, they're just trying to beat Avatar. Right. That's different. This isn't like Matrix is trying to beat some record. Do you guys remember seeing Matrix in the theater in 1999? I yeah, I really do. Because that is the weirdest thing is I don't. Like, I remember, I know I went to see it. I yeah. saw it at the Kabuki 8. And I remember, like, walking out of it, like, wondering, like, what was that that I just saw? So you remember... I, the location, and you remember the feeling of walking out of it, but you don't remember be sitting I, in the seat. I don't watching. remember thinking that was the best movie I've seen since Star Wars. But then when I watched it later on DVD, like a hundred times, um, I, I, then I realized that. I don't think I ever thought it was the best movie I saw since Star Wars. I was the right age for it? No, I, and like I saw it in the California theater in Berkeley. Mm-hmm. Um, but and like I loved it. And, and I loved it partially because the cut from the kind of sepia tones of the beginning to the Matrix world, I was just like, I've never seen something that looks like this, like visually looks like this on screen. It was rated R, of course. And I think that I, I definitely appreciate it for the martial arts and, you know, the J- JV philosophy stuff more than uh, the filmmaking in the same way that I didn't appreciate fil- Blade Runner the first time I watched it, right? Like it's the original. It, it being, yeah, original Blade Runner but being sci-fi noir, yeah. right? The, uh, the, I think a lot of that was absorbed later viewings. Definitely the special effects and the martial arts were the things that stood out for me. Also the marketing campaign. You remember like the big campaign for The Matrix was uh, no one can be explained, no one can be told what The Matrix is. And so you've, there was this whole mystery. Of what it. is The Matrix? What is The Matrix? What is The Matrix? Exactly. And of course it is literally just explain to Neo in the movie. So they did a good job with building mystery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is actually a good year for anniversaries. Um, You're uh, saying 99 was a good year for films. But. Well, no, I mean, it's also 10th anniversary of Star Trek 2009. Oh, it's true. Wow. Oh, my gosh. That. Wow. And related to that, there's a documentary that's out um, from uh, the family of Anton Yelchin, who played Chekhov. He passed away in a tragic accident, um, and his films are being rescreened. Uh, like crazy Star Trek, and then there is documentary in which a lot of the cast and crew and the filmmakers that work with him, including J.J. Abrams, uh, they, they talk about what it was like to work with him and what a you know beautiful person he was in yeah. addition to being a uh, great actor. Yeah. Um, don't, all right. Don't forget the 50th anniversary of Apollo. I mean, right? Yes. It's yeah. all, it's oh, all, what now? It's all. <laughs> I haven't heard Apollo. Uh, uh, let's get through the, the other bunch of uh, news. GameStop, uh, there is news here. Kind of sad. Well, not just kind of. It is sad. Uh, GameStop is being like it's it's kind of transforming. It's into uh, it's it's new. It's final form. It's, it may, I don't. Know, hopefully, <laughs> this does kind of sound like it's final form. But they had let half the employees go. Oh my gosh. Um, what what does that mean? Like are they shutting down half the stores? Oh, sorry, they they were laying out fifty, not fifty percent of their field leaders. Okay. So maybe not half, but they're definitely kind of rebuilding their stores as gathering places for esports and retro gaming fans. And you see, and, and and that to <laughs> me says a lot of like just retro gaming merch, Atari T shirts. Bring it, and, and that's already there, which that's is already there. Not enough right? of it. I always shop it, and there's not enough. So bring more. This is great. 
uh, and being less of a essential place for people to buy new games and, and new consoles. Well, what it is is a place to sell your games. Like, there's a holdout of people who still buy physical copies of video games, and it's a good idea because GameStop exists, and you can go in there and sell it for more than you could sell a, a digital copy for. I, I mean, know. this is a place for us to talk know. about what was what's been what your GameStop's ex- offers are usually like. Here's ten cents for it's or tr- no, Red Dead Redemption. It's true. It's yeah. true. But it's ten cents you wouldn't get from a digital copy. Wouldn't you just rather keep all those games in a bin so that twenty years down the line you can open no. that bin up and say, "Oh, let me plug this game in. This cartridge in." I don't, are we still there? Like, I feel like nostalgia. That nostalgia works for old con, like the first generation of eight and sixteen bit consoles, but not for later ones. Am I wrong about that? I, I definitely for the PC world it doesn't work. Like yeah. CDs, I got rid of all my CDs. I used to keep game boxes, uh, not the big ones, but when they shrunk down to more DVD size boxes, I used to keep all those boxes, and I had to purge because a lot of that stuff is on good old games and Steam, and you don't have a computer that can run those anymore. Like not the discs. Do you even have a CD ROM? No, I don't. No, no, yeah. bro. Yeah. Do you even have a CD ROM? <laughs> <laughs> I actually booted up. Uh, speaking of anniversaries, booted up Crisis. A couple oh, yeah. days ago, just to see how it would run on a new video card. Can your computer run Crisis? It turns out not at 4K with everything <laughs> turned on on very high settings. But there is a video. This is a complete tangent. But the uh, I think Digital Foundry um, put out a video where they ran this shader pack that uh, turns on quote unquote um, well it's SSAO but it turns on ray tracing they yeah. call it like lots of bloom effects and ambient occlusion um, on a per frame basis uh, that makes Crisis look even better huh. and they hacked a way to get multiplayer in there i think like importing maps into crisis 3 uh and, and did a whole video it's a really fun like nostalgic video and it made me want to boot up crisis to see what did crisis look like what is it looking now you know what it looks good but it doesn't look as good as i remember yeah okay i can imagine that that's yeah. probably true for all games yeah that's like a 12 year old game now is that it yeah crisis 2007 Wow. The opening screen of Crisis is August, like the year that the events happen on that island are like late August 2020. So next year would be the true anniversary of the events of Crisis. Huh. Yeah. One of my favorite memories of that is at the end of the game, and spoilers, you, you fight the, the aliens uh, on an on a aircraft carrier. And EA, for their launch event for Crisis, was held on the USS Hornet. Oh, yeah? Is yeah. That, that's the one right here in the That's in the Bay. Alameda. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, a little bit of a nostalgia for GameStop. I'm really curious to see what that final form is like. I do stop in the GameStop occasionally. I mean, if, if it's in the mall, why not? Let's see. You know, pick up I still a go there to buy like used Switch, Switch game. games. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, re up on your Game Informer. I used to try to uh, be a console behind, and that's when GameStop was just like the best because I bought a Wii last summer, finally. <laughs> And I was like, and then you could go get games for the Wii for like five bucks. It was great. Yep. Uh, two big pieces of DC news. The first is in the TV world. There's a big uh, cross show event coming. Uh, crisis on uh, or Infinite, or it Infinite Crisis. Or crisis, crisis on, on Infinite, Infinite, Infinite Earth. Earth. Infinite Earth. Okay. So it's not, okay. So it's paying homage to the original Crisis story. Mm-hmm. Crisis on Infinite Earths. Not exactly the same story, but Supergirl was a big part of that story. Yeah, and, and so Supergirl is the flag, one of the flagship shows in the current TV DC universe. And so it will be a crossover between Supergirl, the Arrowverse, uh, Legends of Tomorrow, Flash. Uh, Flash, Black Lightning. Maybe Batwoman, which is a streaming show. We don't know. No, it's, it's not on CW? Yeah, I thought it was going to be streaming on CW. W seed. Maybe oh, it's wow. maybe it's gonna be on air too. Wait, you, it's Batwoman, but Supergirl. These are the names from the mm-hmm. from the, the comics. Are they okay? There's a Batgirl as well. There, so there's a Batgirl and a Batwoman. Yeah, yeah. Batwoman's a whole different character from Batgirl. Are, is there an actual age difference? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yes, the whole course. Supergirl Batgirl thing was in the kind of this golden age of, or maybe the silver age of comics when they were sidekicks. To make it more kid-friendly, a little yeah. more relatable, you know, you had your Spider-Mans over on the Marvel side that every kid wanted to be. So uh, for the DC side, in addition to the Batman Supermans, you also had the younger, the sidekick versions in the Robin, the Supergirls, and, and the, the Batgirls. And uh, later on, there would be 
just the other counterpart. So Batwoman having her own story. The super uh, Supergirl is from Krypton. Supergirl yep. is its cousin of Superman. Because you can't just get a sidekick. Like yes, you have to. Yeah. Have powers. Superboy is a clone of Superman. Uh, of Superman. <gasps> the original Superboy was just young Superman, young Clark Kent. His story. So as he was growing yeah, yeah, up yeah. with the Superman costume. But the the more uh, the newer Superboy, which was born out of death of Superman. Uh, Connor Kent is a clone of Superman who just does not grow old because of the cloning problems. Wow. Yeah. He doesn't also have uh, fully have Superman's uh, powers. Yeah. But, There's like a whole monitor. There's a whole oh like set of characters yeah. they've like teased and introduced that are setting this up. The, but, the, the big news is casting news. And this is perfect fan service. Very appropriate casting. We had already heard from San Diego Comic-Con that Brandon Routh, who plays um, uh, Adam over at Legends of Tomorrow, is going to actually also play Superman, come back as Superman in Christ on the Infinite Earth as the Kingdom Come version of Superman. And Alex Ross did a drawing of Brandon Routh as Kingdom Come Superman, which is really cool. Uh, but we also have the casting of Kingdom Come Batman now. And that is none other than one Kevin Conroy. The, the Batman. V- the voice of Bruce Wayne Batman in all of the Batman the Animated Series. Oh, with Mark Hamill as the Joker? Yes. Wow. Guess Kevin. who also got cast yesterday? Who also got cast? Mark Hamill. <gasps> as the Joker? What? Wait, live action? Really? This is amazing. Wow, that's interesting. Wow. That's his awesome fan service you can do makeup like, like so i saw a fan board that was basically like is this show just a series of cameos and <laughs> we're just gonna not do any story around it I'm like yes let's just do that i'm okay with that i mean are they just gonna like zoom in on kevin conroy's mouth and have him like controlling the bat robots in the kingdom come world He's using this voice so wait how do i watch this <laughs> it's on the cw it's gonna be on the cw on the it's cw be, yeah, it's gonna be on, on that, that's uh, basic cable basic cable is that or, on U- youtube tv? tv you can get that over the air my yeah. friend what yeah wow all right yeah. great yeah i can't wait to see that uh, and then the other dc news not really news but um new gods is in development and we had one of the writers of new gods is teaming up with the director uh, who did uh, Wrinkle in Time, um, um, Ava... Uh, DeVorne. DeVorne, who also did uh, the... Uh, that recent Netflix documentary series. Oh, yeah. Um, the Central Park Five series. Mm-hmm. And the big story, though, and it may be not, not a big story, but the concern is we love New Gods. This is like Jack Kirby asked Jack Kirby. Uh, Dark Side will be the villain. But how will mainstream comics fans receive that? Because it is very similar to well, Thanos. Well, I mean, and the, and, and the to Eternals. be honest, Thanos is a copy of Dark Side. And that's Side. the truth, right? You guys should do a comic podcast. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you guys, well, we've been sneaking it into this podcast, <laughs> and every week. no one has asked for this comic podcast. <laughs> right. Been trying for a year. I'm very excited for New Gods. I'm really excited to see how they're going to make it uh, their way versus how Marvel's going to do the Eternals. Because they have said for the Eternals, it's going to be Jack Kirby as hell. And we did see already a little bit of that Jack Kirby influence in Thor Ragnarok. So I, I, I want to see the artistic style brought, brought to live film. Last bit in pop culture I want to discuss, a little bit of discussion. Uh, maybe light spoilers, but Amazon has a show out called The Boys. This is a comic book adaptation uh, mm-hmm. based on uh, like a 72-issue series run uh, written by Garth Ennis, who, is, uh, who wrote Preacher, wrote a lot of Punisher. Uh, he's very known for uh, very kind of brutal, vulgar, extreme stories, kind of very subversive s- stories and takes on, on superheroes and uh, violent for sure, and Amazon uh, adapted it, and it is being showrun, uh, written by the guy who did Supernatural, along with uh, Seth Rogen and his writing partner. And it's been, I watched the whole thing. Kishore, you watched the whole thing? I watched the whole thing. I have like up on the screen a shot of the heroes behind you. The, the seven. I got to give it a thumbs up. It is brutal. It, it, it's brutal, but if you've read the comic, it's not as extreme or vulgar as the comic. There's some stuff in the comic that I think would really be difficult to translate on the screen and I wouldn't want to necessarily see on the screen and the, and be really uncomfortable watching but this is a violent violent show it's super violent and it gets into it pretty quickly uh 
Carl Urban in full Carl Urban oh, powers. Yeah, yeah. He's fantastic. Like, he I realize fantastic. you can't have TV shows as part of the film festival, but this should be part of the Carl Urban Film Festival. So if you're not turned off by violence, Jeremy, and I don't know mm-hmm. if, if, then let me pitch the show to you. As long as it's like hand-to-hand combat or like weapons that aren't guns, I find guns boring. They're, guns are not the violence. Let me yeah, give you an example of the violence. Guns. So the, the setup is it's a a realistic modern world where there is a Justice League equivalent called the Seven. And you have all these archetypes that are very reminiscent of the DC superheroes, a Superman-type hero who leads them called Homelander, a Wonder Woman-type hero uh, called uh, Queen Maeve. You have Black Noir, which is like a Batman character, hilarious because Black Noir is just black, black. Mm -hmm. And then you have like an Aquaman-type character, uh, Speedster, A-Train. And... But the conceit is that they're just people. They don't have the purity or the ideals that you would have in a comic world. They're corrupt, they're violent, and they're run by a corporation. They're in it for the profits. They're sponsored by this giant multinational corporation that makes their movies, that sells their merchandise, and that runs their PR. And so they don't really fight crime. Crimes are kind of like staged for them or or they have a team that lets them know where the crime's going to happen. They just show up, kill the bad guys, and then pose for the cameras. Uh, and the story follows their newest member, a, uh, a young member named Starlight, as well as their foes who are a kind of a CIA black ops team run by Carl Urban who want to take them down and, and reveal their true nature to the world. Mm. So that's, the, I think, a very interesting setup. It's very Garth Ennis, very Mark Miller, um, and I think they did an amazing casting. Um, uh, the Homelander guy has such a punchable face. Oh, my goodness. Anthony Starr, wow. he's a New Zealand actor. He, his shit-eating grin is a perfect transference of like a Gary Frank or a, or a Steve Dillon uh, drawing, even though I believe it was a, a Scott Erickson who did all the art for the boys, um, who did Transmet, Transmet Paulden also as well. But in terms of violence, you have like their Superman mm-hmm. character, yeah. Homelander, is basically like the villain of the show. Like I'll describe one scene, which is a little bit of a spoiler, but you know, they try to save a hijacked airplane. And he, how, do you, how does a Superman character save a hijacked airplane? Right, well, you pull open the door, you come in and then you take out the terrorist. And he gets in and he basically uses his heat vision, his laser vision to cut the terrorist in half. Like you see it. He just goes zoom and the terrorist is literally just sliced in half with gore mm-hmm. everywhere. And then something goes wrong with the, the rescue and he makes the decision just to, well, nothing I can do here. I can't lift the physics of this plane won't let me save it, like, you know, actually stop from crashing. Superman so just, could. Well. The, he actually, the, there's a line in there that's great when, because there's like, why don't you just like, pu- like push pu- against the plane? Push against like, the plane. Well, so, well, that would just crumple the plane yeah. because of the structural integrity of the plane. Hmm. Like, I see. When you have Superman lifting a plane, the Super- physics. Like, Superman is just a comic. This is yeah, real. Yeah, this is, this is <laughs> the, the gritty real version. So they just abandon ship. They're like, sorry, going to go. And the people are like, what are you doing? Save us. And, and they're like lying. Like, Everything's going to be all right. Uh, let's get out of here. So it's dark. Okay. Yeah. 97% liked it, according to Google users. It, I'm really impressed with Amazon Prime. You got The Expanse. You got Miss Maisel, which is totally different. Uh, this, Good Omens. Good they're omens. on like a, yeah. a, quite a, a streak of in, incredible shows. And, and this is diversity of shows. This is built into Amazon Prime. Amazon yeah. Prime okay. show. Yeah, it's it's. I think they're doing a season two for sure. I, I think I think it got better over time. It lagged in the middle a little lagged, bit, but yeah, yeah. start uh, and ending are incredible. Performances I think are are fantastic, and they really made a Superman type character creepy as hell. You know, there was that uh, James Gunn produced um, a film, uh, *Brightburn*, which is like, what if Superman was a kid who was who was also like the Omen, right? It was like who was evil. And it wasn't received that well. This feels like what if that kid grew up, and Superman, while being a uh, while being the shining champion, you know, as a, the public facing image, you know, behind the scenes, swears, curses, threatens, kill people. Like the world would be afraid of him, and you get that sense of palpable fear of like we wouldn't know what to do. I think they tried to touch on a little bit of this in the Batman v Superman movie of like what would happen if a god 
you know, existed on Earth and tried to, you know, run America, you know, diplomacy and, and military, right? And they, they pushed that, that idea further in this show. It's really good. Okay. The boys. The boys. And that does it for pop culture. Oh, I'll hit the button. All right. Uh, in other earnings news, Apple had their big earnings last week, right after we recorded the podcast, too. And the big news there is uh, they are relying less on iPhone than ever. Less than 50% of their their uh, revenue came from iPhone sales, and they sh- had strong uh, growth in their mm. services and their accessories specifically. They don't break that down. Uh, the thing I'll take with a grain of salt, because this services stuff doesn't include any of the uh, the Apple TV stuff, the new TV show subscription service, the game subscription stuff. I think a lot of people are kind of waiting to see how the, the public will receive those because yep. we don't know what that content's going to be like. Uh, but on the accessory stuff, the big thing is, is it more Apple Watch sales or is it more AirPod sales? And, if it, and I, my feelings like AirPod sales really, really spiked and helped them this past quarter. So easy to lose. Yeah, and what is the iPod cycle? Do you know anyone who's bought new AirPods for the sake of buying new AirPods because they've had them for over a year or two years and no. they need an update? No. I feel like if if the AirPods are the uh, the fashion statement, the cool thing, to, accessory to have... Norman, I wanted to not believe you on that, by the way. I hate that idea. I know, idea. I know. And I was like, you, he's making... He sounds smart when he says that, but that can't be true. It can't be. People aren't wearing those as fashion accessories. I went to Camp Mather like this summer. They <laughs> with were no 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 reception. No cell no phone reception. reception. And there were there was a guy wearing them all day long. <laughs> <laughs> Solid. You should ask your ask, ask your son on on the in the schoolyard. What do the kids want more oh, than magic no. cards? I don't want to believe it. I probably AirPods. And you know the the emojis now. Can you be able to add that as an accessory it, to your emoji? See, but this is not where the growth is. Like, fine, they'll get like minimal hardware growth with i like. No, AirPods I do. And... I do think it is. I do think at that hundred seventy dollar, two hundred dollar price point, they're selling a lot of these to people who previously would not even consider spending more than forty dollars on headphones. But what they're pushing is more the service side of stuff, like the TV show, the TV whatever streaming service they're gonna do. Uh, and you can see, like, like the chart had services at twenty one percent of their total revenue, and like, I think that's a lot with their iCloud stuff. Yeah, right. They're getting people to buy in on a monthly subscription to pay for storage because as people have had these phones and tablets for over ten years now, you know, the the idea of storing everything you had on the device locally is becoming dated, and now you're bu- you have to kind of buy into backups and and. And I'm storage. telling you, like I'm tech support for my family, my extended family, and people call me when they hit that limit, and they say the phone's telling me I should upgrade because I've run out of space. Oh, they do it. It pops up from the bottom. I just tell them the upgrade is the by far the easiest solution. Like it is not elegant what you have to go through in order to avoid upgrading. Yeah, up- upgrading to a to a, a higher pay, a paid actual paid. Yeah iCloud subscription. Or even a bigger, you know, just a larger subscription. Yeah, yeah. We do a family plan as one. I think that's something that they're baking in, and that's going to be a good, you know, growing revenue uh, model for them. But I am a little skeptical about their streaming services, uh, or uh, their digital services, especially the the game one, the video game one, Arcade. Uh, And then on the accessory side, you know, yes, I know there's a big market for Apple Watches, and they've sold a lot, but I just don't know if the upgrade cycles on either Apple Watches or the AirPods are going to be enough, uh, or going to be in the, uh, the right cadence for them to match the iPhone cadence right. of people buying every two or three years. Yeah. Paying $1,000. Uh, other Apple stuff, Apple Card, some details there. Some people have uh, started using them. They released it to a select number of users. So I don't know if any of you got the notification. I did not. But some users got a notification. They are able to go into the wallet app and add an Apple Card then you get the option to get the physical card for free, uh, sent to you the titanium card with no number printed on it. But uh, it will be rolling out to the rest of us, all the peons, later this month. Um, are you going to get one? Why no. 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 You know? it's, I mean, it's another credit card. I don't need another credit card. Yeah. 
I, I don't buy enough Apple products to take advantage of that. To the percentages the, the percentage off. discount, yeah. yeah. I mean, there are some interesting for people who are going to do it. Of course, they've done some, great, some interesting UI stuff. I think the the, the kind of a color spectrum visualization they have of what you spend your money on, you spend your money on is, yeah. is neat. Uh, but that's info that other credit cards can give you as well in, in traditional pie chart and bar graph form. I think I'm going to do it though because three percent off an iPhone, and I'm due to get one this fall, is is substantial. So I might do that. I'm not going to get one this fall. Really? I'm going to say it now. If the form factor is the same, and the only upgrade is this new reported uh, camera, camera system, yeah. then I think holding I'm, out for I'm 5G. holding out for five G next year. Okay, because I don't want to get one this year and get one next year. I hear you. So I think I'm gonna I'm gonna wait. I I feel like I feel comfortable with that. Waiting is also a tough thing. I mean, they're so smart about this, right? They 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 release something with just enough new features that for some people who can't resist need to get, but they hold back on some other features. And sometimes it's the design ID that gets changed, but they don't necessarily always do a design ID plus the latest you know, hardware on the inside. And that may be the case for the rumored MacBook Pro 16 inch. Uh, that's been rumored for a long time now. And theoretically, it's supposed to, based on some supplier reports, it's supposed to, uh, analyst reports based on their conversation with the suppliers, it's supposed to replace the 15.4 inch MacBook Pro, which is, you guys use a 13 inch. I have yeah. a 15. Oh, you do have the 15. Okay. So the idea is that form factor may be replaced with the, the same volume, but thinner bezel, which will get you a 16-inch screen, although with the same pixel density. Uh, and that would be a up to eight-core system uh, using Intel's ninth-gen Coffee Lake processors. Now, the reason that's notable is that it's not in time. That's the same Technically, the same processor that's in the current. If you buy, a, you go to the Apple Store right now, you buy a MacBook Pro, yeah. spec'd out, decked out, you would get the latest Coffee Lake processor. Uh, you would not get Ice Lake, the 10 nanometer, 10th gen Intel processor, for which Intel just revealed some more product release uh, information for uh, on their Y series and U series. So it's a little disappointing for people who want uh, the, the Ice Lake in a new form factor MacBook, but then you probably have to wait till next year. Well, next that. year is a big, big year for Apple. And that sounds like next year might be a big year. Still in here the word touchscreen, so. I don't think it's, I mean, Ugh. yeah. So I, it weird. might, it would probably have a new keyboard though. So weird. And that yeah. might be enough for a lot of people to switch over. Uh, in terms of the Ice Lake stuff, the, what was announced by Intel You keep was, moving on. You keep doing your awesome transitions. I got to throw in one more thing about okay. the Apple card. Okay. The Apple card restrictions. If you do get an Apple card, you have to agree to two things. You cannot use it to buy cryptocurrency. So you can't go to those ATMs at at Stonestown or no. Sarah at the mall and, and, and buy Bitcoin. And I think Bitcoin. most credit cards have that. Uh, you can't use it to buy, you know, alternate cash uh, currencies. Why? I, it's like, I don't know. I don't know. Would you want to lend somebody money to buy Bitcoin with? I don't know. I wouldn't want to lend anyone money to, <laughs> to buy anything. No, but with. I mean, it, currency is currency. Like, you're saying you can't use your credit card to, yeah. to buy a Canadian dollar? <laughs> well, Canadian dollars are real fiat, so I don't know. Maybe maybe you can do it for that. Um, I feel like we need Gunther here for this conversation. That is that is a requirement, and if you end up doing it and getting away with it, you uh, you might have your account locked down. You might not have access to your to your credit card. Hmm. The other thing that um, you have to agree to, yeah, you have to agree to. Uh, what was the other thing? Uh, I forget. You have to show everyone you meet the titanium card. <laughs> <laughs> Look well, at my cool titanium card. No jailbreaking. Yeah, no jailbreaking. Yeah, so that's like I haven't jailbroken a phone in five to ten years. I don't even remember the last time I, I jailbroke a phone. It was like early on. Um, so you can't do that. And that makes sense, right? Because you don't want to let people get access to whatever's inside the, the Apple card. I can't wait for the. There's going to be a black edition of this card that is going to be exclusive. I want the Batman edition from Batman Forever. It's titanium, man. You could like. Okay. Throw it. <laughs> uh, speaking of the Ice Lake processors, what Intel uh, announced for Ice Lake, which again is their 10th generation, 10 nanometer um, processor, is on the mobile side, uh, ultra portable. So they have their um, their U series, which is the, the higher power level series, which goes up to 28 watts, which is pretty good for uh, four cores, eight threads. Uh, and the Y series, which is for the thin and lights, that goes up to 
12 watts, 9 to 12 watts, uh, which you'll find in a lot of the well, uh, Ultrabooks. Uh, the big difference, uh, the big benefit, though, is their new Iris Plus, which gets you close to MX level graphics on the NVIDIA side, and the idea for encoding and decoding might be not just more power efficient, but more powerful uh, for people working in 4K video. Um, last bit of Apple news, and this ties into a little bit of uh, Microsoft news. Microsoft has a, a new ad. Or they, they streamed a new ad mm -hmm. last week, and it's their take on a Mac versus PC ad, and they had someone switch from... Uh, Mac Not just someone. to PC, really? and they hired a guy named, well, MacBook. His name's Mackenzie Book. Oh, God. To testify that the, the Surface 2, the Surface Laptop 2, better than a MacBook. Whatever. I, yeah, yeah. This is, I don't, I'm not the biggest fan of Microsoft's ad campaigns. Like, they, they've had this, like, campaign with Common for Microsoft AI. I've seen this on TV. It's been running for months and months. And it's not the, it doesn't explain anything. You know, it, they must have spent a lot of money on it, but Microsoft's maybe just riding high. You know, they're the most valuable company in the world. They're, I don't know, actually, after this, after this past week with the, uh, the trade war stuff. But, you know, trillion dollars, they, they had the trillion mark for the longest time, and, but I, I don't think they need to do this. There's better ways to sell, I think, their Surface laptops than to go with this gimmicky way. It's getting us talking about it, I guess. So maybe that's... We're that's only talking success. about it because it's referencing an, the best can ad campaign Apple ever did, which is I'm a Mac, I'm a PC. Yeah. And that, that's the only reason. Like, that, it's, that doesn't seem like a novel The time has passed otherwise. for that type of... I mean, Samsung does it, and I, I don't think Microsoft needs to go Samsung level hmm. you know, with, with poking fun at Apple. Yeah. I think you, that's just a tacit acknowledgement that they're going for the king. Yeah, you know, the, the Surface laptops are great by themselves, and I think the other campaigns of them, of the people using the laptops touching the screen, I think sells the, a lot more. Uh, other product news: DJI uh, has new FPV goggles for drone racing, and I love the look at these. These are these are digital FPV, so this is not analog signal. It's their low latency digital signal, and the goggles themselves have four antenna sticking out. Yeah, and they look futuristic and high tech. Yeah. They, Kind of bugs bug like. It's a uh, almost a thousand dollars. Oh my goodness! Because uh, of their their controller, their receiver, their transmitters, um, but it allows that camera system to be plugged into anything. And they say latency uh, twenty eight twenty eight milliseconds. milliseconds. Yeah, record and they can record local live feed of ten eighty p, and it streams at seven twenty p at one hundred twenty frames a second. Are which you is cool? You think you're going to try them out? I would love to try them out. I don't have a practical use for them because I, I have, haven't done I mean, done isn't FPV it pretty much for drone, drone racing? It is for drone racing. I haven't done that in a long time. Yeah, it's, uh, not, it's, not, it's not VR. It's not stereoscopic. No. Right? And no. how big is the actual like TV in front of you? It's probably relatively small. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, 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 it's, it's HD it's, enough. I don't know the field of view yeah. exactly. But it's all about the low latency and the, the high, high refresh rate. You want you want to get as much information as possible if you're flying at high speeds. Yeah. But if you're building a remote control system, for example, that you want locally, to, you know, whether it's for a tiny tank or some type of RC system, uh, this could be a, um, a turnkey solution. Even though it's kind of expensive. It's very expensive. I, I mean, mean, if you consider on in, in the FPV world, it's a little divisive because a lot of people just love analog. Yeah. And they they want almost zero latency. Yeah. But the highest costing analog systems will get you up there close to a thousand dollars. We're talking about with the transmitter, with the receiver, with the antenna systems, with the, the signal processing units. Like that can get pretty expensive too. And are those high frame rate as well? Are those 120 hertz? I think cameras. I do not believe those are because that's pretty. Um, that's pretty high. Yeah. The other thing about analog signals is they're prone to. They they degrade well. Like they, they do degrade. Well, I think DJI's algorithm, their signal processing, has allowed for some of their irrigation to be less of the traditional. Yeah. Just. Um, pixelization and use loss of signal. Yeah, I think that you do get signal degradation in a, okay. a, a, a if not linear, but a you know not just on off. Way. Well, I was going to say like while it does degrade well, the analog signals are also you know they 
oscillate between clear and not as clear. They're not all the, they don't sustain clear. Right, exactly. Whereas the digital signals do, and yeah. I, so I'd be curious to see if that's one of the selling points here. I'd be curious if there's any drone flyers out there, if you're excited about this or not. Well, those people also, are, if you're recording locally, you're recording the best quality possible locally anyway. Yeah, but the big draw of this is FPV it's flying. FPV. Yeah. And, but the thing you also lose, I guess, is it, the ability to share. One of the real big benefits of analog yeah, is... Yeah, that's a good point. many people who have the receivers, if you were within range, you can get that same analog signal. If you're at an event and you have, have goggles and you sitting in the stands, you can tap into the feeds. Yeah, and change between the feeds quite easily. You don't, you don't have to be into yep. a, a locked-in ecosystem. A uh, few bits of, well, let's talk about some SpaceX, some Elon news. What's going on with the Starship? So we're going to get an announcement of the Starship project, which is an orbital kind of launch vehicle type thing. Thing on August 24th, he said in a series of tweets he's going to go through the design choices they've made around it and potentially talk about some of the timelines. I'm so, like, if you hear the hesitancy in my voice, it's because his announcements are so unpredictable as to what is going to be shared hmm. that it's, it's just not even worth speculating. Like, Neuralink was just sort of so far off the rails of what you would expect based on his tweets about it ahead of time that I think we just wait to August 24th and see what it is. Uh, like, I'm excited to see what the design choices are for something like this. He's been talking about this for, what, like two years probably? This uh, is a part of the Mission to Mars program? Yeah, this goes on the upper stage of the, the rocket. The retro-looking, <laughs> very shiny rocket ship. Uh, and then the other bit of news is they had kind of, they had a launch earlier this week, uh, and uh, it was really to test their boat recovery for the fairing. Uh, and let me see if I can put the video up. I'll do that of uh, of it. But there's like a boat that's sitting out there that oh I I can't capture it. Oh here we go. There is a boat sitting out there with a net in the um, in the ocean. And as the fairing comes back down to Earth, they have this, it has a parachute deployed, and they move the boat right into position, and it caught it in the net right above it. It was sort of perfect. They've tried this a couple times. This is the first time it was successful. Is that boat manned? No. Crewed, I, remote controlled? I think it's remote. I don't think it's crewed. Uh, but the uh, interesting thing is, like, there's this great video. I think the boat next to it is the one that actually has a crew where the, the video is actually taken from. Yeah. Um, uh, it just saves a bunch of money, just like landing the rockets. It doesn't save nearly as much money as recovering the rockets, but it's just another piece of, of monetary savings. And it's just kind of cool to see. It's really cool. Imagine a fleet of those. I want to know more about how that boat's controlled. Like if it's actually physically controlled by somebody who's driving it or if it's using some sort of it's location, coordinating location with, data with right. the falling yes. rocket. And, and, and anticipating it. I mean, yeah, because yeah, it's yeah. falling pretty fast. And yeah. trajectories, like uh, you can get kind of close, but at some point you need some visual identification. Yeah, depending on how big that net is. Yeah, uh, especially since it's coming in on a parachute. Right. So it's not like, you know, <laughs> like a little wind, it's like going to be <laughs> off by yeah. then. Well, maybe they calculate, like, at some point they can release the parachute and get more accurate trajectory, but you need to make sure the net is then strong enough to, to catch. Yeah, I mean, one of their earlier missions, I think it was only less than a month ago, you could see the fairing, like, miss it by, I don't know, a couple couple dozen feet? Ooh, nothing. Yeah, so, and it, like, it, it hit the water and it was lost. But, wow. um... You're not going to win the big stuff monkey that way on the... The arcade, the, the carnival arcade. I mean, million dollars a year, million dollars there makes a big difference. All right, last bit to text some video game news. That's what we say in my family budget. <laughs> <laughs> no man's no man's sky, no man's sky, no man's sky, right? no man's sky. The big update. Yeah, when the, the updates and all updates. Presumably, there will be further updates. The date has been confirmed. August fourteenth next week will be the no man's sky beyond update. This. Uh, includes uh, three major updates. Online experience, VR support. Shut up. Next week? Next week. With multiplayer and VR. Wow. Yeah. All right. But but people hated this game. Well, no. Th at launch, it didn't live up to its promise. But it's got a lot of promise. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, yeah, I, I can't wait for this. Uh, I, got, I got to play a little bit of it in VR um, at the, the Index Preview event. Uh, and I had not played the, the game, but I, I think I'd want to play it only multiplayer. I don't know if how much I'd want to play it just solo. No, I have been told you got to go back to it, that it's gotten a lot better. Because mm. it was just a grind, yeah. do-nothing open world game. It was very procedurally generated and not enough handmade you know, to make it compelling. But it's, uh, I think in VR... Even that launch version might be interesting. Just the exploration factor. Yeah. Uh, Monument Valley is getting a sequel, another sequel. Monument, Monument Valley 3 okay. is in the works. Uh, this is one of the most successful iPad games. Had a very successful sequel. Even was used as a plot point in the Netflix show House of Cards. And uh, it's a beautiful game. Uh, and I hope they take advantage of the new displays on the, the new iPads. The Rocket new League is ditching loot boxes, friends. Oh, it seems what, like a good thing. Do you know what that means? What so does that mean? You can still, to this day, go into Rocket League and throw your money on the table, get a loot box, and you don't know what's in it. And you open it up, and maybe it's good, and maybe it's not, and maybe it's not good enough to get you what you wanted, so you throw some more money on the table. Get another loot box. And the kids are doing this. And the companies are being sued because kids should, it's gambling, shouldn't be you know, compelled to do this by a game company, by a game. And uh, so they have said... As they did with Fortnite, Epic now owns Rocket League. They bought Psygnosis. And, is that what the game the studio is called? And with Fortnite, they got rid of random loot boxes earlier this year. They're going to do the same thing with Rocket League, which is good. These are the two games that my, my son plays, and I'm glad to see this because I am on the side of saying that it is gambling and they should not be doing loot boxes. All righty. Is that it? I think that's it. Let's, uh, let's go to the next segment. It's time for a moment of science. I've never heard that in stereo. Holy that cow, so much better. Uh, again, I'm sorry out there for people who are not going to be able to hear it in stereo. Psionics, not Psygnosis. Psionics makes Rocket League. Uh, so this week, FDA approval came to uh, Impossible Foods to sell their ground, quote unquote, meat in grocery stores later this fall. Um, this is similar to what Beyond Meat has already been doing in Whole Foods and other grocery stores. And in fact, uh, Beyond Meat's products were, like in my local Whole Foods, were actually selling out. Um, so there was just a, a high demand for this, uh, for this plant-based meat product. Um, this, I think this is great news. Just another consumer alternative if you want to look for something that's potentially healthier when it comes to like cholesterol or fat content. Um, I think it's um, it also going to pose an interesting challenge to some state policies that are underway to ban the use of the word meat on these products in stores. So hmm. there's a lot of meat trade associations, like usually it's um, farmer uh, coalition led um, representing dairy farmers. Uh, to ban the word meat being used on the packaging. I mean, I, I I guess if they come up with some alternative, it doesn't matter as long as it's sold in that same place. People get what it is. Have you had one at Burger King yet? I have not had one at Burger King. I had an Impossible Whopper. And you know what? So my review of the original Whopper isn't great. <laughs> <laughs> and my review of the Impossible Whopper is it tastes kind of like a Whopper. That's well, good. Which is like I think exactly they, they've done like, exactly what they set out to do. That, that's exactly does what it, does it taste flame broiled? No, <laughs> no, it doesn't. Okay. I mean, you can still taste the difference between an Impossible Burger and a yeah, normal yeah. burger. Yeah, it's close enough. But like on a Whopper, you really can't oh. because like it's, I already it's all think, about the toppings on the Whopper. Yeah, exactly. So I thought it was fine. I think this is a great step forward. I haven't bought any of the Beyond Meat products to try to grill at a barbecue. Have either of you? I've just had it in the restaurant. Yeah, I'm curious to try like how it actually yeah. works on a grill. Um, but I think this is a great step forward. All right. I got two weird stories to wrap up. This is one of my favorites. This is from an amateur. He calls himself gastro-Egyptologist. Uh, and there's a great Twitter thread uh, about this from Seamus Blackley. He uh, went to a... Um, a, a, a anthropologists, archaeologists, one of those types, at mm -hmm. the Peabody Museum at Harvard. And they had uh, a series of pots. And I'm, uh, if you're watching the video, you can see a picture of the pot. 
and these pots are porous. And he went into... Can you he, zoom in more? Yeah, he isolated um, some dormant yeast from oh. porous pockets in this, uh, in this pottery. Uh, and then essentially woke them up <laughs> um, and grew them and then made bread with it. And so the idea of this is that you're making uh, an ancient bread loaf because the yeast strain that was probably dormant in that pot doesn't exist now because of evolution and whatnot. Mm, Jurassic carbs. Nice. Uh, and what he did is he used an ancient grain, which is a grain from, um, from uh, hundreds of years ago, and freshly milled it so that when he put this yeast strain into it, he was also using sort of like a fresh product and one that was different. And he said the, f- the bread itself, when it proved, smelled different. And this is like, he's like bakes a lot. Um, just smelled different. Uh, and then the, the whole texture and the crumb tasted completely different. You can see the, the finished bread product there. Now, he's quick to say that this hasn't been verified microbiologically, um, that this is an actual ancient yeast strain. You have to actually sequence it and make sure that some other yeast strain didn't come through and outcompete it. Um, but he said this is like a different kind of sourdough that it exists uh, now just by isolating it. I like the idea of like this as a growing amateur habit. And his his title of gastro-Egyptologist is my favorite <laughs> modern uh, take of something. If that gets verified as an ancient yeast strain, can they grow that and, and kind of store it and start making more of this type of bread? Yeah. Why not? I've lost my cursor. <laughs> I found the problem with this situation. Oh, there it is. It's coming back. Um, all right. Last story. Uh, and this is a weird one. Uh, you've heard of Witch's Hazel before? Uh, I've heard of Witch Hazel. Wiz, witch Hazel. Sorry. Yeah. Singular. Um, well, there it was a study that came out this week on Chinese Witch Hazel. And Witch Hazel has this uh, weird, uh, I don't know, evolutionary habit where it ejects seeds out of its pods uh, to try to get it away from its original plant location so it can outcompete from from both itself and um, uh, the other plants around it. Well, this study uh, looked at the pattern of uh, ejection from Chinese witch hazel, which grows under a canopy. And what they found is that this witch hazel was ejecting seeds at a speed of around 12 meters per second, Whoa. which is 26 miles an hour. And it was doing it because like the sides of, um, of, the, uh, of the seed were essentially sort of like squeezing it and ejecting it like a bullet. So like it would grew, it would blossom open and then the sides would squeeze down and eject it at a bullet. But it had this like little shape at the end that would force the seed to spiral. And so it spiral out, and they did a lot of slow motion analysis of it. And you can see the the video that uh, I played. Uh, they calculated some of these witch seeds have gone 18 meters in length at 26 miles an hour. Are they hurting people? It makes an audible sound when it ejects. Pop, pop, pop. pop. And uh, they don't know of anyone that's been hit by one, but I just thought it was crazy <laughs> that mean, we have a plant that can shoot something Almost at the speed of a bullet. I mean, nature finds a way to to spread. Wow. I think that's my favorite weird weird study of the week. We got to grow some of that. How does the distance compare to, like, witch hazel that might grow here? Oh, it's like, it, it's so much farther. And it's the idea, because it's growing under a canopy, somehow it evolved this yeah. ability to shoot its seeds way beyond the canopy to compete. <laughs> The VR Minute, virtual reality this week. A bunch of VR to talk about this week, but before we talk about the news, I want to give another shout out to the game I've been playing, probably the most recently, and that's Pavlov. It's on Quest. If you sideload it, it's on uh, it's on Steam VR. That's what you're uh, playing it, right? I'm playing it on on the Index. Yep. yep. And yeah, it's it's like Counter Strike. You know, there's a lot of search and destroy, deathmatch, team deathmatch modes. Uh, but the best part is the the user generated stuff. The user generated maps are so good. They're re- little recreations of uh, classic Counter Strike maps played like CS Office, Dust Two, and it's 
letting me experience those games and those those uh, in which I spent countless hours on. You were a Counter Strike player. I played so much Counter Strike when back in high school. Like when? What years? Like ninety nine, two thousand. Okay. 2001, maybe 98, a little bit as well. One point, I played CS 1.6. Because we weren't playing that at, at PC Gamer. No, you, you guys, none of you guys played it. At I all. was trying to sell you guys on it. You guys were on Quake. You guys were on uh, TF. You guys were on the World C? War II. T- TFC was huge. TFC was before my time. But after TFC, yeah. you guys were on Day of Defeat. Uh, Day of Defeat. Yeah. Day of Defeat was great. Love Day of Defeat. You know, before there was Call of Duty, there was Day of Defeat. Yeah. Uh, but I play a lot of Counter Strike. At home. At home. Got it. I think you guys played Rainbow Six as well. Yeah. That, that was probably a bigger the, the thing that was most similar to Counter Strike. Uh, but to play that in VR, amazing. Is it? Yeah. It, it's, I mean, amazing from, for someone who grew up with Counter Strike and yeah. to see those levels and to hold the, you know, the, the loadout menus and the, to play those rounds, hold those guns in, in VR, super cool that I hmm. never thought I'd be able to do. But the most fun I've been having in Pavlov, is in a game mode that's an adaptation of a Gary's Mod game mode called uh, TTT, okay. uh, Trouble in Terrorist Town. Have you, have you ever played TTT? It's Negative. basically uh, werewolf or mafia, but in a FPS setting. <laughs> so the map... Werewolf the talking game? Yes. <laughs> so we got to play this. We got to find okay. like six other friends and then nine people of us it's nine people max or I think nine or ten, ten people max should jump into a uh, a map and play this so we can even play it with like seven people uh, but it basically is is mafia you, the maps are it doesn't matter what the map is usually there are smaller maps uh-huh. like sometimes there's a Minecraft inspired map which literally looks like you're in a Minecraft world or a kind of a Roblox like a like a like a Lego style world that really the aesthetics don't matter but you have all the same weapons that you would have in Pavlov okay. that you find around. And typically there are, in, in, the, in each round, which lasts, like, I think, I want to say four minutes, uh, there are three people who are the traitors. <laughs> and the traitors know who they are, and they have little T mark on top of their head, but no one else knows who the traitors are. You're saying the traitors know who each other, who, who the other exactly, traitors are. Other traitors okay. are. The traitors know who, all the, who other traitors are. Everyone else is an innocent, and you look at your wrist to see your health and also to see the word innocent or traitor. Yeah. And then there's one person who's, who's a detective who has the ability to buy a scanning tool so they can like uh-huh. vet two people oh. and vet them as like innocent or traitor. Okay. And so it becomes a social game, which is like, which is mafia, but in a VR FPS setting. And I know there was a Ubisoft made a, like, a werewolf game like a straight up werewolf game uh-huh. but there was no free locomotion that you were sitting around a campfire yeah. and you were talking to each other yeah, and, and you played the, it out. the game properly yeah you play the game here because there's free locomotion because there's a shooting element you're just kind of running around and there's so much interesting mechanics that would only work in vr there's like i've played games where people have you know the the, the sheriff you know the the, uh, the detective will find deputies real quick and they'll like tell everyone drop your guns and and stand against the wall and now we're going to uh, try to find out who is a terrorist and like you, the little micro behaviors of people that yeah technically would work if you're playing with a keyboard mouse or gamepad but are much more noticeable where people's heads are looking like how they're scanning the room mm-hmm. or how they're hanging around the back of the pack and you know, and, and keeping everyone on their sights. This stuff is accentuated by VR because of the track controllers, which makes it feel more like a real social game where you're in a room with someone. Okay, so the traitors are supposed to kill everybody else. Traitors to kill everyone else. The detective is there to help, help save everybody. Sort, sort things out. And yep. everybody else is just supposed to survive. Survive. And so how are you supposed to kill everybody if you threw all your weapons down? Well, then typically you can try to run away. Because some of the maps are big, and you can find other weapons, and then and and, and and then like camp and try to pick people off. You can that has happened before. <laughs> okay, you can throw smoke grenades, yeah. uh, flashbangs. Mm-hmm. The, once the chaos happens, people are very mindful who shot who shot first, and and yeah. and who, what people are doing. Uh, there's a lot of scenarios where the traders will kill each other to try to like one trader will kill another trader just to they look good. To, so they'll look good and they'll huh. be believed as an innocent. And at the very end, they'll grab a, a shotgun and and you know and and win the round for everyone. Yeah. Um, but and a villager can kill another villager accidentally too. Accidentally, there's a, there's many times where 
the conversation, they'll convince, they'll, 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 people will be tallying, okay, <laughs> I think that person, there must be only four, uh, you know, one terrorist left and yeah. four innocents left. No, I'm innocent. And, and exactly, and then you can <laughs> get two people to, to turn on each other. Yeah. And it's happened. And even if you lose the round, you're in a ghost mode. You can watch everything unfold, you know, fly up in VR and, and see the whole map and see how people are running around and hear all the conversation. I see. So it really requires having like the voice, right? The, the VR headset and, and the, the voice comms. Uh, but it is, it, it's one of those where you, uh, one more round, I'm playing one more round, one more round. Really? And suddenly it's 2 a.m. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm up so to that's, try that's my recommendation. And I, I, I really want us to try Pavlov uh, VR. Uh, uh, on to news. Okay. Um, HTC has some big news. So we had heard about uh, the Vive Focus Plus, right, uh, which is their standalone six-off headset. Uh, they had pricing for that, which was, I believe, uh, pretty high, I want to say, on uh, the Vive Focus. Actually, I don't know the exact pricing on this. Uh, but it was higher than we'd expected. Um, it was like $700 or something more than the, the Quest. And we're wondering, well, how can this compete with the Quest? Well, at the China Joy conference, they announced their strategy, and which is going to be streaming over Wi-Fi from the PC. But streaming not just any games, only games on the Viveport service, which is their subscription-based, you know, buy once, uh, buy, uh, and, and, or subscribe and play all you can play okay. uh, when they have 800 titles there. So this is an, a solution like on the Quest, like ALVR or Virtual Desktop has introduced. Had introduced. It's, which was, it's, it's back in, but you have to sideload it. It's sideloaded. Yeah, exactly. It, basically, that functionality works over a five gigahertz Wi-Fi connection uh, on, on laptop, and it will come uh, or PC, and uh, it will become it will come as an update to the Vive Focus Plus uh, later this year. Why only Viveport? I mean, why not? Steam? I mean, I think their business model is getting people. That's onto it's port. just they're all in on their own portal now. Yeah, hmm. yeah. So I think we, people, a lot of people wish it would be for Steam. I don't know how many units this is going to move. Yeah. I think it'll definitely for people who have who are looking at invested in uh, the the Vive Focus will definitely be more interested now in subscribing to Viveport. And you know, to this credit, it may not have a, the exclusives that Oculus has, but it has a lot of you know. There's a lot of VR games who are on both. Steam VR and and Viveport, yeah. and if you're talking about a ten dollar or thirteen dollar a month subscription to play all those games. If you play a lot of VR, then it's not necessarily a bad deal. Uh, on the also on the Steam VR side, the Valve Index, which we've talked for weeks about the the thumbstick issue. Well, something unrelated to that, also on the hardware side, is uh, Valve has canceled the USB uh, C virtual link uh, dongle. This was something they had previously offered as a pre-order. They thought that they could replace. Currently, you need to plug into DisplayPort plus USB-C and power, but you could all replace that with one virtual link uh, connector that can plug into latest generation video cards. Uh, the 280, 2080s have them. Uh, but uh, it did not meet their, uh, their QA. Okay. So they've canceled and they've issued refunds. Refunds. Okay. Yeah. Which is unfortunate for virtual link as a standard, I think, because the hope was that going forward... You know, uh, hardware manufacturers, Oculus and Valve would start integrating these, especially yeah. if more video cards have them, especially on the mobile side. Uh, but the fact that this, and maybe this is just an index specific problem because we're talking about higher frame rates, more throughput, and reliability was just not there. And possibly more power. I don't know what Virtual Link was supposed to deliver. Yeah, but. right, because there's also USB, full USB uh, yeah. 3 um, adaption on the, on the front of. Uh, on the Valve Index, uh, which also, if you have the recommendations, to play without the the front uh, the plastic that allows it to play. It's just a little bit cooler. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Oculus Connect Six it's is com coming, coming up. up. I know it's uh it's in a month. Been over announced. A month's and time. Registrations are open. Yes, uh, we're going to be there, uh, and hopefully, we're going to be there to play uh, Respawn's. Triple A VR shooter. Yeah, no one knows that, anything about it yet. Yeah, so it's well, it's going to be a VR shooter, and it's going to be a big <laughs> budget shooter. Uh, so, in addition to you know games like Stormland, yeah, uh, waiting for that, we're also now eager to hear what is it just going to be a trailer? Or are you going to be able to play it? You think playable? I think play it. I did say playable. What do you think the odds are? It's just Apex brought to VR. I would be less interested in that. There isn't a big battle royale game yet. 
It's true. True. Yeah. And obviously, that's a trend. I, I, I am glad it's coming out now, and as opposed to your, they're working on it now, as opposed to it being you know, something that was released a year ago or two years ago. Yeah. Because I feel like a lot of games now are much more open to free locomotion as a standard. I think in the first generation of games in VR, we really wanted to move the way we moved in the world. Right? I was thinking about this playing Pavlov. Now I just almost think about movement as gamepad movement. You know, I'm gliding through the world yeah. and just flying through as if I was holding a, a gamepad using thumbsticks. Uh, the, the real one-to-one interaction comes in when I want to aim or interact with right. near f- objects, you know, holding some type of uh, weapon or yeah. holding some type of interactivity thing. Uh, or, or sometimes ducking as well, leaning around corners. But, uh, but in terms of getting around the world, it's really just gamepad movement. And yeah. I don't feel any less immersed because of that. I prefer it and... I, I, but I do understand that they need to include a teleportation in order for, uh, you know, to cover all their bases. For, for comfort for some people. Yeah. Yeah. But then how do you balance a multiplayer game? Like, Rec Room has that problem. Right. You know, you it's, have to, it's, mm-hmm. if you're hardcore, you join a, a game that just has one kind. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm curious to see what they do. Um, if it is Apex, I think that would be interesting, but I'm hoping it's something brand new, just like you. And, uh, you know, maybe this is selfish, but I hope that it's desktop only. I was going to ask, do you think it's going to be on Quest? You know... At this, I don't think they could have changed at this point. Like, whatever they were assigned to do, whenever this was, they were hired. Right. Um, it's, since Quest came out and it's sold so well, I, I could imagine Oculus wanting it on there, but I, I doubt it's... The directive... Change, change direction. Right, the directive now, if it was something that was pitched now, would, yeah. have, would probably be to, to be on Quest maybe first, or at least, the very least, both platforms. Yeah. But I hope it's desktop only. I want them to push graphics on this. Yeah. Um, speaking of quests and graphics, Red Matter is coming to the quest. This is from Vertical Robot, and it's coming next week, and they released a video showing uh, the enhancements they made for quests. They're very excited about this. They're saying it is absolutely possible to do good graphics on Quest, and they have done customized shaders in Unity in order to achieve some pretty interesting things. We can't... This, this is not... I think the contrast is a little off on our TV, yeah. but if you find this video online, you should check it out. Um, it's pretty remar- remarkable. I like that in the video they have some, uh, what they call the ray trace, one laser, ray trace lighting, yeah. so for mirrors, and I don't know if that's for puzzles. It's uh, Red Matter is a... There's no shooting. It's, it's, it's a... It's a straight-up puzzle game. Puzzle more, adventure yeah. game, you know, alternate reality. You're on Mars? Is it the moon or Mars? I'm going to go with Mars. Mars, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's a Soviet bent to it. Uh, yeah. But it's, uh, it's, it's from our reports, very good. I did not get too deep into it on PC, but I, will, I plan to go back to it on Quest. Yeah. Something you are looking forward to playing on Quest or have been playing on Quest? Pinball FX2 yeah. VR. Um, I, finally, there's no pinball on Quest. There, there's one side loadable homemade game, that's, that's, but that, there's no commercial games yet. And this is the, they're finally bringing Pinball FX2 VR, which you might have expected at launch, given that it was on go, I think at launch. And, you know, I don't know if it it sold well or not, but it certainly got good reviews. And uh, it's finally coming. It's going to come next Thursday, I want to say the 15th, um, to Oculus Quest. Pinball FX2 VR from the Zen Pinball guys. Still no sign of Zen Pinball 3, uh, or whatever they call Pinball FX3, uh, which has the new Williams uh, classics built into it. I'd love to see that at some point, but I will take this in the meantime. Awesome. I'm, I don't know if it works with PinSim, but as soon as I get a build... <laughs> You'll be trying. I will try it and let you know. And, uh, well, let me g- jump to the, uh, the last bit of Oculus news first. Uh, the Quill team has launched a big update to uh, enable more animation support. So this is animation tools in VR. So as you use Quill to draw... Timeline, uh, keyframes. Keyframe animation, right? Yeah. You have a full timeline. You can actually, the examples have them, you know, you, you paint a train, you can actually have it go along a track by do, doing full keyframe animation and multiple audio zones. So when, yeah. as people stand relative to the model, they can hear different things. This is all to... Uh, encourage animators to create VR animations, which is, I think is a great thing. Yeah, they're calling it Quill 2.0. It looks really cool. I'd love to hear from animators out there to hear what you think about this. I mean, I think they want, first and foremost, artists yeah. in there just creating stuff first, static stuff first. Uh, and then the, my question is, how is this then exported? 
Right? Is this just are these just animations you can view in Quill and in Capture mm -hmm. for, uh, for flat screen, or are these animations then you can import into other animation tools? You mean like rendered out two D? Yeah. Or 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 like are these keyframe animations can they export? into things that you can in ingest in other animation tools. You mean like a 3D animation tool? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep, maybe. Yeah. Uh, Gen Con was this past weekend. And I wish I was at Gen Con. I was in Indiana. And Jerry Ellsworth was there uh, showing off Tilt 5. So this is the, we've talked about before, the kind of reinvention of the cast AR system, uh, a tabletop board game AR system uh, that allows for single user or multiple users to basically experience uh, augmented tabletop games, whether it's D&D or any other, you can imagine any other kind of tabletop game uh, using a projector-based system. So It's the same principle as their earlier Cassier, product, exactly. Right? As a far field, they have micro projectors, uh, built stereo, into the headsets, built into the headsets yeah. project onto a reflective surface that bounce back exactly into your eyes so you can see uh, basically wherever you look, as long as you're looking at the surface, you can see some type yeah. of augmented image. And everyone sees their own image because the retroflective material just bounces back the light that's sh shown in one yes. direction. And so the compute can be differently, even you can be shared information. Right. What your projectors are projecting and what you're seeing could be completely different than what I'm seeing. And it also allows for a remote play as well. So if you have Tilt 5 at home and I have Tilt 5 at my home, sure. we have the same board. We just have to orient the board, you know, and you know who's sitting to who's left and right, and we can play in kind of an augmented multiplayer game, mm -hmm. which is very neat. Uh, but they're talking about the Kickstarter will be later this year, I think September, and they're hoping to ship some first units by the end of the year. And so uh, they have taken their lessons learned from Cast AR, and it sounds like it's going to be a real product. I think they're trying to get more developers into it. I really can't wait to try it, uh, since I'm curious what projector technology has how that has changed since then. Uh, they're being very transparent on, on their Twitter account they about even put the boards. A, and yeah, the board picture's out. Yeah. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, there's no word on pricing, but they did say cheaper than standalone VR headsets. So I imagine somewhere in the 200 to $300 range. Uh, and then uh, last bit, there was also s happened this weekend. We weren't either of these. We weren't at Gen Con and also weren't at Star Trek Las Vegas. And one of the things that was announced... Uh, alongside Star Trek Las Vegas is a VR experience, Star Trek Discovery Away mission. This is in partnership with the company Sandbox VR, location-based VR company, whose tagline, if you search them, is it's basically like the holodeck. So works works for them. And uh, this will be in the Sandbox VR Hong Kong and SF Bay Area locations this fall uh, and worldwide in 2020. So I really want to try this. This is yeah. a, a boutique-designed Star Trek theme experience. Uh, they have props that you track props, a uh, phaser props, and I'm, I'm curious what type of what type of holodeck type discovery tie-in will they have? You must go. We have to go. We all must go. Come on, Star Trek. We haven't even done the void that's opened up here yet. Oh, together. is it open already? Mm -hmm. Oh, only it has the Star Wars experience though. Oh, uh, I mean I've done that. We've all done it. Yeah, yeah. I want the Wreck It Ralph. That's what I haven't done yet. Or Ghostbusters. So uh, that does it for. The VR Minute, and also for the podcast this week. Jeremy's going to go set up for an outro. Anything you guys want to talk about or promote? Uh, I'm screening Blade Runner this month as a tribute to Wrecker Hauer. I think it's sold out, um, but next month at the Alamo, we're 10th anniversary of Star Trek. Of 2009. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Any special guests for that or just no, you guys me. talking about the film? <laughs> <laughs> You're a special yeah. guest. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I think I'm going to watch that. Oh, else. and... Uh, I'll be at Silicon Valley. You'll be at Silicon Valley. Yeah, Silicon Valley Comic Con is next weekend. Uh, I think I'm doing a panel on Saturday. Details to be announced on their site. Uh, but yeah, it'll be probably be VR related. And, um, and Adam will be there for an incognito as well. So if you're in the Bay Area, hope to see you there. That's in, in San Jose, San Jose Convention Center, uh, Saturday and Sunday. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Jeremy, uh, Project Tank Ball, still going strong? Yeah, still going strong. It's at Mixer slash... Something. Tank ball? I don't know. I will I find out. Just other ocean. Well, I, it used to be, and then they sw they made a tank ball account. Mm. You guys actually checking this? Yes. I'm actually, you can actually put it, on the, good research. put it on the screen. We could play. You could be playing tank ball uh, it is Wednesday, right now. They do stream today. They stream yeah. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It is. Yeah. Mixer.com slash tank ball. People is it, is are this playing. Live? This is live. This is live. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> we could have been watching the whole time. 
That's great. So they got wow. they got like a laser projector for Starfields, and they put flags on the tanks based on what country the players from, at least. In, so in they'll, they'll, they'll like have someone they'll just ask them in plug chat, in. like where are you from? Like, pl- but plug it in. There's yeah, like a yeah, whole like yeah, a, a physi- library physical. of flags and. Oh yeah, they bought a bunch of flags. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. We should have that running in the background. Yeah, the well, whole time live I'm, tank ball. I'm sure Mike would appreciate that. <laughs> okay, check that out again. Mixer.com slash tank ball and we got an outro this week we do from wohawk he's back with chateau picard <laughs> go hi there i didn't see you Pass it. uh we gotta go with some picard news and we were in the countdown to picard 2020 <laughs> picard wow we're, from, we're starting our count early <laughs> yeah mars 2020 we'll take a back seat to <laughs> picard 2020 Star Trek has started, has actually, uh, is going to release Chateau Picard, the wine. Chateau Picard. A Bordeaux? Wine. Chateau Picard. What's the year? Wine. Chateau Picard. It is purple uh, water. The wine. It's a blend. Chateau Picard. The United Federation of Planets wine. wine. It's a 2017 old vine Zinfandel from the Dry Creek and Russian River Valleys in Sonoma. Chat, 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 Chateau Picard. The wine. It's not going to matter to you because you're not going to open it. That's true. You're not going to drink true. it. We got an update on that, don't we? Yeah. Guess who ordered some Chateau Picard wine? <laughs> nice. I think I'm, I'm in on that order as well. Yeah. We uh, do a taste test. I forgot to say I played Jurassic Park pinball <gasps> at Replay Effects. Uh, okay. There were seven of them there, and I played oh. it, and it's good. Nice. It's still a month away from release, but it's good. This is the new game by Keith Elwin, who's like the world's best, who won Re- Pinberg. Again. Oh, again? Yeah, he won again. It's first first time anyone's <laughs> ever won two years what in a row. What a flex. Winning t- record-breaking, winning twice in a row, and also debuting yeah. a Jurassic Park pinball machine. Yeah. Does the T-Rex come Come uh, out? It it does. It, it moves its head around, and on the premium and the LE, it will eat the ball off the ramp, and then and then throw it, or place it very gently on a ramp, depending on how it's feeling. Throw it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the pro, it's T Rex is there, but he just judges you. <laughs> he just stares at you. That's how. That's how. Uh, that's what it's <laughs> for. All right. See you next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>